You go to New York today, um, that's Paris tomorrow, Tokyo today afterwards. So how funny is that in real life? Um, well, it, it, I mean, yeah, it can be if if um, if you're able to find time to to you know to, to actually you know you know go around and sightsee and take pictures. But you know, most of the time that's not the case. Um, it takes you. It takes you in, in some, it, it takes you a day or, or or a day and a half to get to where you're going. So when you're there, when you finally make it there, you, you're either hungry or or, 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 or sleepy. Um, so you usually do that up until the time that you have to play. And uh, the only really time that you have is, is normally after. Is is after. You know, after you play. Yeah, after after you play. And if there's on a day like this, if you could, if you could find find energy to get up out of the bed, uh, to, to, to go see, um, yeah. But you, know, but you never really get into really seeing the city, you really, you just don't have that time. So it can be quite lonely, especially if you travel alone, because you really don't see that much, you really don't get to meet that many people. Um, you can't really buy things because, you know, you're traveling from country to country, and you, and you need to travel with as less as possible. So, like now, I'm down to like a very small bag that I carry, and I just wear the same clothes for six weeks in, in, in a row. And, um, you know, wash the underwear and the and the and the sink in the hotel, and you know the socks and things like that. It's 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 a it's um kind of kind of degrading actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, and then and then the other side, yeah, it's, it's quite nice. You get to go to places that you never thought you would go to. See. Yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, you've been known for a special style of DJing, like um, just showcasing particular parts of a record, which is not that prominent um, among techno DJs, especially. And for that, I mean, you've been sometimes playing a record just for some like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You must leave crates, leave crates and crates and crates of records. How do you pack them? Um, when I, you know, when I buy records, or, or the ones that I pick for my record box, usually have you know, very rarely do I ever play a, a record that only has one good track. They, they have to have more than two. Um, so then I can play the same record, uh, you know, at, at least twice, twice a night. So I, so I carry very, very few. Um, and it always seems to just balance out that that record is of, say, Atten Bay or, or someone like that, or Marco Carollo, or, um, you know, DJ Sneak or something like that, who, who just has a particular sound that just sounds good. So um, it has to has, have more than at least one, unless the one is really good, and, and, then, and then I'll normally pack it. But that's to keep everything down um, to, a, to, a, to a minimum when I travel. Um, and if I should have more records than my box um, should, should hold, I won't buy another box. I'll, I'll just I'll just recirculate the tracks. I'll, I'll take the ones that I don't play so much out and put the ones you know the new ones that are really hot in, and uh, to, to always keep a, a certain amount of records, about sixty records. So so it'll seem like I I've got like maybe two boxes because I'll, I'll go through them so quickly, but actually I'm, I'm playing I'm playing the same record maybe twice three times a night. So um, this particular style, how did it evolve? Then? I mean, you just didn't grow up to be in the death notes and then mm. um, the record that way. Uh, <coughs> well, in Detroit, uh, years years ago. Um, well, in, in my case, I, I I used to do a radio show in 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 in, in Detroit, and um, over the years the show got shorter and shorter because of you know that's just how radio stations are. They 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 make your show shorter because of precious time. But still, there was an abundance of music that had to be played. So I had to figure out a way to be able to play all this music in a very short time, very smoothly, so that people would at least hear a little bit of it, so that they would go to the shop and, and actually buy it. So, uh, you know, we kind of developed a way to be able to play them very, very quickly, or just use a, you know, the best part of it, and then move on to the next one, you know, the best part, and then move on to the next one. So applying that 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 type of idea along with the long mix or 
you have to have two records just play for two or three minutes. Um, kind of creates a, um, a another option to be able to get you know, to play records. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always the same way. Uh, in some cases, as I look out into the crowd and I see that the people just need to be able to get started, you know, the party just really needs to get started. Then, yeah, then the, you know, the quick mix doesn't doesn't apply. I should, uh, you know, take my time and and uh, let, let the people really get used to actually, you know, the sound system, the sound, the type of records and things like that. So it, it, it varies. Um, if the people really, really want to party and I, I can see it, then yeah, then I can, I can apply it. So um, I think most, one of the main problems then is after all this hard traveling and to read this crowd and to get the motivation for that, how do you manage that? Um, well, you, 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 just, you just have to do it. You don't have a choice. I mean, you can't say, okay, I changed my mind. You know, I, I flew all the way here, the, the people are paying me, the people are at the club. You just, you just can't change your mind. You just can't say that, well, I'm, you know, I'm sick. This is, this is, this is part of, this is, this is the job, you know. And, um, you know, this is, this, is, this is what you're there for. This is, this is, this, this is what you spent all these years, you know, buying records and reading magazines and, this, this is what it's for. So you find the energy, even if you're tired. In some cases, I've been I've been so so tired I could barely open my eyes, you know. Um, but then, you know, when the first record hits, then you know you never know the difference. But then after, you know, I usually pass out or something like that. You know? but, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's it, it can it can be really rough, especially night after night, flying country after country. Uh, you know late night, in the middle of the night, and things like that, it can, it can be really hard. Um, this radio job you've been talking about, uh, was this like your first assignment as a DJ? Um, it was, it, well, that was, that was the point where I, I became like a professional DJ. Up until then, I, I did, um, I was considered like a, a, um, a, mobile, a mobile DJ, where you, you put everything in the back of your car, and you travel to the place, and you, and you pull everything out, you hook everything together, and you play the night, pack it back up, and you go home. Um, and I just so, so happened to be at the right place at the right time, and did the right thing, and, and got this job working for a radio station. And then that, that radio station had other stations around the country. So I traveled around the United States, um, going from, from, from coast to coast, city to city, uh, doing, like a, doing what I do on the show, live. So, so I, so I had traveled all over the United States um, before I came to Europe. So I, I was, I was kind of used to playing for people that I never seen before. Uh, you know, you know, walking into um, a club, um, not not knowing what the people may like. So the experience of of having to have to read the crowd within 15 minutes, and I learned at you know a very early age, actually maybe 20. Um, when was it exactly when you got that job? Uh, around around 19 or 20. I, you know, I wasn't old enough to get into the clubs, so they had to kind of sneak me through the back door and things like that. So, and, and it was, you know, I, mean, I wasn't old enough to drink. So if you're not old enough to drink, you have to be 21 in the United States. So so they would have to, you know, sneak me in, let me play, and then and then get me out to the back. You know. yeah. So um, um, what kind of stuff were you spending back then? Um, that was that was pre hip hop, so it was more like post disco funk, Tina, Tina Marie, um, and um, um, you know disco was still lingering around, so so you could still play some of that, and people would still remember. Um, think you know, things like Junior, if you remember Junior, it was really really poppy poppy music, but. On the vinyl copies of, of the pop music, there, there was always a mix that you could play. Uh, that was like an instrumental or something like that, or like a bonus beat. Or, um, so, so, so you would, you would you would mix those things, or you would just buy two two copies and repeat the same part over and over again. So that actually made you a better DJ because you, if you didn't, you know, catch the mix, then uh, the vocal would come in and mess the whole thing up. So, so you would learn how to repeat the intro over and over again, and then jump to the part which um, made you much more nimble uh, on, on finding certain parts very quickly to be able to, to um, 
to, to make a different mix. It, it, I, I got so good at, at, at one time that that uh, the radio station, you know, we would do like master mixes of of a particular track, which 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 is normally done by edits. But you know, but I would do them in, in like one shot. I would I would I would take I would physically take the record apart, and um, and, and and just just with like a mixer and two turntables, uh, re redo the entire record without without a single mistake. You know, and. Um, yeah, that, that was a long time ago. So, so from, <clears throat> from that till um, getting a work contact in these days, what happened in between? Um, hip hop came along, and, and that elevated the DJ um, much, much higher. Uh, the DJ gained much more respect, and he was put uh, more up front in, in, in terms of the, um, you know, how, how he was perceived. Um, he became much more instrumental in, in the actual music, not, not just playing the music after it was made. And um, I was at the age, and I had, I was right, I was, I was, I was right, I was, I was at a certain, certain point where I was, I was really acceptable to, to learn all, all the tricks that were be, being done at that time, um, that were being created, and things like that. So, so I, I actually had the opportunity to learn all these tricks really, really early. So um, I, I, had to, I had to jump on, on, on you know, the hip-hop DJs in the United States. And I also had the form to be able to play them on the radio. So that kind of re reinforced the idea that maybe this guy is, <coughs> is much further ahead. So uh, when did you start and what your first steps into a production? Um, in Detroit, there was a lot of competition. Uh, amongst the radio stations, and it was quite it was, it was quite unique because we we, um, we 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 had the authority to be able to do anything we wanted to, which was really rare at that time. Um, usually, a radio station they tell you what you have to play and when you have to play it and for how long. But um, because the competition was was so serious, they gave us well myself on the station that I was at. And the the you know the opposite station, the, they gave us complete authority to be able to play anything. So um, the competition got really hot very very quickly, and um, I, I needed to be able to have music that the other <coughs> guy didn't have. So I began to um, at first I began to contact the rap groups to actually come into the studio. Um, and record different versions of this hit record. So uh, I remember contacting like U uh, UTFO and the Fat Boys and um, um, uh, a, couple, a couple of other groups, and we, and we would cut different. It was a big station. The station had a lot of money, so so we could actually do that. I was like 20, 21 or something like that. So I would come up with this idea to bring them in to actually do different versions that the other stations didn't have. Um, so, 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 so that was the first thing that, that we did, and then uh, the other station started recording um, the things that we did, and, and we're playing them, so you really couldn't tell the difference. So then um, I came up with the idea to uh, bring live instruments into the studio, and to actually um, uh, make the music just prior to the show and actually play it during, during the show and then never again. Um, and um, one, of, one, of, one of the first artists, one, one of the first groups was like, uh, um, if you have to help me do that, was, was uh, 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 the, the, the guy that made the track Technicolor that was on Metroplex. Yeah, we were really good friends. And he brought his 808 into the studio and uh, we recorded a completely different version of it. And, and and then soon that led to me actually making music along with three turntables in the studio um, for the you know for the for, you know, for the actual show. Then I thought, well, it's not so it's not so difficult. So then I built a studio at home uh, to do the, the production there, and and then bring it in to, to make it even more complex. Um, and then um, um, uh, it it. I decided to make an album, and then one thing led, led to another. 
So if you can imagine a kid, say 16 years old, listening to all this on the radio, you know, you can see why maybe like a Claude Young come, comes around, you know, or uh, like a Terrence Parker, you know, after listening to all this battling and all this, you know, you know, how to edit, uh, you know, music and, and make certain mixes and things like that, then it kind of makes sense, you know, like, like the, the, there's a, there's a, a, a you know, group of DJs that, that just listened and, and recorded all those things on the radio at that time, yeah. So, um, but we're talking mainly, I mean, just to make sure, um, when we're talking about live instruments, we're talking drum machines and stuff like that. Uh, drum machines, um, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. But, and um, from there, we're talking more or less hip hop right now, but in the pre UR days, you did something like more industrial influenced mm. um, color things. How did these things come together? Um, Detroit at that time was really diverse in, in, in dance music. There was a very strong industrial scene in, in, in Detroit. And it was beginning to mix with techno. Um, some of the techno DJs, like Derek would play at, a, at, like a, at, at like an industrial club. And so all the techno people would go to this industrial club and then vice versa. Um, so those, those two formats of music became very, very close. And um, um, it kind of, you know, the music kind of reflected that actually, I think. You know, the earlier stuff on, on Final Cut was actually an album you know, fusing the two together. I had like a techno background and, and the other guy had like an industrial uh, uh, ministry, revolting Cox type thing. So we, so we got together and, and made this album. So very European. Yeah, and that, that was the first album that I had made in my studio, actually. So as I was building the studio and, and learning the equipment and, and how to use it, um, that, that album was, 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 was made. Um, that was the first time that I had learned how to bounce bounce tracks on a, on an A track to get a total of 24 or something like that. So um, from there on to you all, how did that go? Um, well, uh, I I split with uh, the guy from Final Cut and and uh, we we had gotten involved with some major labels that didn't work out. So I was completely disgusted. At, at you know I was still doing the radio show at this time. And um, uh, I, I knew Mike because I, I Mike had a lot of keyboards, so so I would borrow keyboards from from him because you know to put it together with all the recording equipment that I had in my studio. And um, so just Mike thanks just to make sure. Uh, well, well, I mean, I, I, I met Mike another way. <coughs> I, I met him through another person who suggested that I should go and, and meet this guy and his group to to see if I can help them with. A mix that they were stuck on, and uh, I, I met Mike in in, in this, this this other group that was with in a studio, and uh, we you know remained friends, and we eventually got together and uh, came up came up with this with this idea to to put together this group called and label called uh, Underground Resistance, and uh, well we we talked about it for a while, and um, and. Um, uh, the most important thing at that time is that we looked at what everyone else was doing in Detroit and what they failed to do and where they made a mistake. At that time, Kevin had just Kevin Sons. yeah he had, he had just just finished um, uh, the second album second album for Inner City, and we had heard that uh, Virgin was kind of kind of jerking him around and they wanted him to make much more commercial music and uh, Juan. They, Juan was making much more commercial stuff too, and Derek was trying to sing or something like that. And so we thought that, uh, that that's just not the way to go. That that, that the original idea of, of Detroit techno was was getting lost. So we thought that we should be more bolder. So we should do everything that they failed to do. So um, that's exactly what we did. So um, we didn't license music out to everybody. We, we didn't. We, you know, we just didn't. We, we, um, kind of constructed our own way of how we work and, and, and how we do things. And, and so that was the beginning. And neither of us had much experience in running running the label. We, that was more like a trial and error. So we lost a lot of money uh, in, the, in the early part of it. 
you know, got a lot of interesting phone calls from a lot of interesting people that I still remember <laughs> today. And um, um, yeah, I mean, at, at one point, uh, Apex Twin had sent us a tape, and it was it was it was uh, the first analog bubble bath, and we passed on it. <laughs> so you know, you know, you know, things like that, you know, um, um, you know. Uh, you started off quite soon with the merchandising, which has not been known in that sector of music before, in a way, uh, with the bold logo and the inside out wear and t-shirt and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, when did you get to know about the stuff happening or how your stuff was perceived over here in Europe? Uh, um, jo Joy, Joy Beltram called, called us. Uh, we, we don't know how he got our he's number. He's from Queens in America. Yeah, yeah. We didn't know him then. And uh, he, you know, you know, this is Joey, and you know, uh, I just, I just came from from uh, Germany, and uh, I, I played this track called Elimination, and the crowd went crazy, and we were like, you know, who the, who the hell is, who the hell is this guy, and uh, you know, you know, Germany, <laughs> um, you know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we we didn't have a clue what what you know, what was going on over here. We we had heard some some things from Kevin. Um, you know about what you know what a rave was, uh, you know ten thousand people, and um, but, but we didn't know. And, uh, How large were the crowds at that time in Detroit? Um, the parties, well, they were parties actually. Mm -hmm. and the parties were in clubs, so it was the capacity of, of the club. But uh, the Music Institute was open at that time, um, and. From from my memory, the, the the institute was never really crowded. It was always half full, which uh, which 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 made it really really interesting. You know? It was it was always the music was always amazing, but it was always half full. So, um, but that's how we found out exactly what was happening, and um, um, through through uh, Joey actually. And then I made contact with the only person that I knew in Germany, which was Dimitri from Chisora. Because he had the label Interfish that had licensed the, the album Final, Final Cut. So um, I called him and, 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 act, you know, and told him, you know, you know, do you remember me? My name is Jeff Mills from this group. And he said, yeah. And, and uh, uh, he, he asked us um, uh, if we would want to come over and DJ. And, um, I said, yeah, I didn't want to go by myself, so I asked Blake to come with me. So that was the first time that we wake up to Germany. It was Blake, Blake and myself representing underground resistance. And uh, we, 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 toured, we toured a little bit in, in Germany. And um, I went back to Detroit and reported exactly what we we seen. And uh, then we came up with this project, uh, X, X101. And then we licensed that to Chisora. And then that was the first release of, the new, of, of their new label, which is a, so that's um, How did it feel um, to have a half full of a club running, uh, which has just filled half of its capacity, spawning off such a big thing, and first realizing it? Um, I mean, at, at, at that time, we, we, it, was, it was considered, you know, the Institute was, was considered like a, an alternative club. It wasn't, it wasn't like a main club of Detroit, it was just something, it was like, it was like a late night all night, just one stroll, you know, really, really progressive. Uh, there were a lot of dancers, um, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of artists, uh, musicians that would go to that, to that, to that club. And um, that's, that's it. Um, you know, so the place was only really half, half full at times, you know. Or, um, yeah, it was it was it was kind of like almost like a workshop in in, in a sense. Um, I I can remember a lot of people just standing around listening to the music because Derek and, and Kevin and Juan they they would come back from Europe with all these different versions of all these records that uh, we never knew existed. You know, so I would just go just to listen. Uh, at times I, I would just go to listen to uh, to me to listen to them. So, uh, but when you came then uh, when you came to Europe first time, how did that feel with all that in mind and the feelings of, oh, um, that's probably us who started this? Um, well, um, Germany really wasn't that much of, it, 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 was, it, was, it was more the UK, 
um, they were going to the UK. So we, because at that time there was already a rave scene. Existence. Well, uh, Mike and I, we didn't like UK. Um, yeah, we didn't like England. Um, before we even went there, we, we, we just didn't like it. I don't know, it was just something we decided, we, we just didn't like it. Um, you know, we, we thought the people, you know, from the magazines that we've seen and the, the mixes that we heard and, and the things that, that we heard, we, we, we just didn't like it. And, and also what they were doing to Kevin. <laughs> we, we didn't like it. So we thought that, you know, Germany is much more, it, it makes more sense for us. So, so this is where we wanted to come first, and, and, and this, this is where we came. So, um, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's how that came about. But even though there was some kind of an alliance between certain parts of England and Detroit and this merge camp with the, um, and Kevin, yeah. with later on with the um, Four Hero reinforced crew joined yeah. together, come over and do tracks together. Yeah. Which is still existing to, to these days. Um, yeah, level. but I mean, when I when I came to Germany, I, I did not go to the UK until maybe two years, three years, almost three years after after coming to Europe. I never went to the UK. I went everywhere else, but to the UK. At, at the time, it, it was too much. It was too much, uh, you know, fanfare, and I think um, you know, Groove Groove Rider and Carl Cox, and we. I remember hearing. You know how great of the DJs they were and things like that, and I just I just wasn't interested in, in going into playing. Just, you know the big gigantic raves and things like that. I, I was I was more interested in in because because I had a, a, a little bit of industrial techno background. This was much more appealing to me. Um, but even though um, with the records on you are and on other Detroit labels like Plus Eight and stuff as well, mm. you could tell when the people from Detroit have been to Europe for the first time because there's been it, a certain it, shift in the music mm, mm. Um, Yeah, better understanding. Uh, you, you, I think you, um, you, you automatically understand that, um, you know, there are other people other than the people around you in your city that like, your, that, you know, like the music that you make. And um, I think it, it comes, it, as you're making the music, you, you, you know, you have that in mind, how other people dance to it, how other people um, accept it, and things like that. And over time, you you you, be, you you know you get better at actually making music for a broad a broad um, audience. I think. But let's take for example the X101 mm. compared to the rest of the X10 X series. Mm. Uh, it's a lot more stabby in the US. Than um, yeah. Um, probably even right. Well, well, at that time, um, I. Prior, like early, early, maybe in my, I was 16, 17, um, my older brother was um, a DJ as well. And he, um, he, he, well, with disco, you know, there were a lot of labels in, in Detroit prior to Detroit Techno. There were a lot of uh, disco, uh, disco labels. There were a lot of studios and a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, uh, companies in Detroit that actually made dis disco records. There were, there were a lot of labels, actually, that kind of just disappeared. So he knew a lot of uh, people from that, um, uh, and he would tell them, yeah, I have this little, this little brother, you know, he's, he's, he's trying to become a DJ, can you, can you help him out? So I, I, was, I was actually able to go into like these really big studios and, and watch how they recorded music. So I learned uh, really early how to lay out the mix, how to separate, stereo separate, how to wire all the effects into the back of the board. So, so I had that experience um, in that, you know, like a, a, a technical experience really, really early. Um, so that, that, that helped out in, 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 in the albums, especially with Underground Resistance. So as, as time went on and the equipment got more and more easier to use, I learned how to enhance the sound. So if you listen to the very first on, you know, Underground Resistance tracks, um, the sound separation really wasn't that good. It was, it was because, because I was bouncing tracks over, and once you bounce over, you can't delete, you can't, you can't take them apart because they're, they're, they're permanent. Um, so as time went on, and, and I began to get more into recording um, and understand how a studio should, should work and how to get certain sounds, um, 
the sound got better, and it got, I began to, well, I learned a way to be able to manipulate the sound to get certain feels, actually, over time. So, it, of course, it wasn't as choppy, and, and also I, I made X101 with, with Mike and, and Rob. Uh, X, X102 was more so with, with Rob and myself. Um, and then X, X103 was, 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 was just Rob and myself again. Um, so. Probably that's due to the persons, but um, X102 or X103 just um, made a landmark for um, putting another approach to techno records. In a, in a way, a concept, how a concept is included in, to making a record and not just throwing the bloody machines on and going. Mm, yeah, there is where we learned. Um, actually, X102 was the first time um, where we, especially me, where I learned how to relate uh, the physical aspects of the vinyl to an actual concept, using the label as the most centerpiece and the hole in the label as, as the most definitive piece, and the grooves leading into the label and the edge of the record. Um, and the idea came to, we, we were on our way to Italy uh, for the first time. It was, it, was a th it, was, it was the three of us. And um, I, was about half, I was half asleep, and, and I woke up. It was, it was more like a dream. And I thought of Saturn, okay, so I woke Rob up, who was sitting next to me, and I explained to him the, the whole idea. And then when we got home, we, we started the project. And um, we did like research for a, a little bit to find out the, the names of the, of, the, of the rings of Saturn and what they were made out of, and then we relayed that to, to music. So, so we were learning that particular project, actually. That was, that was where, we learned, where, where I learned how, how, how to make it to, to the mind. Um, you're um, using these concepts these days as well in your records, like on Access on Purpose Maker. Um, it's yeah, the, it's, it's still the same. Um, at times, though, um, because you know, the, you know, there is a balance. You don't want to get so far into it that, that it becomes boring. So you just give enough information to hopefully, um, you know, jar an interest. If not, it's okay. You know, you still have the music to listen to. But uh, to to to, if if I can if I can make a record and also send a message along with it as well, then I think I think it makes it a little bit more interesting. Maybe it lasts a little bit longer. Maybe someone might get more out of it than just listening to it. So. But how, apart from the sound, do you get these messages across to people who don't speak? The language like let's say English. Um, yeah, what what I learned in the last six months, six six to eight months, is that maybe the best way to com to communicate people to, to, to people that don't speak the same language, say some some uh, kid in the in the countryside of, of Spain or something like that, is is to maybe not use words at all, mm -hmm. just images. Um, uh, and even if you do use, even even if the person does understand English and you say a word, it's difficult to understand maybe the depth of the word. For instance, like growth. Uh, if you understand English and you and you read the word growth, you 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 don't know the the um, you know you know you know what the word means, but you don't know the depth. And and um, I, you know, I, that that was actually what the release very was about. Um, it was Acts 6, 16, and uh, it was the degree of what very meant, actually, that, um, you know, was, was, was a question, is it, is it, is it, very, is it, is it very or, or massive, you know, uh, depending on who was actually saying it. So, so I learned that, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe no, no words at all is maybe the best way to communicate in relaying like an idea uh, or, 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 or a concept, just images. So, um, to, but when you're saying just images, you're trying, always trying to keep things as simple, or people might say minimal as well, um, too. But minimal is kind of a big word as well, I mean, it could mean so many different things it's, to so it's, many it's people. It's really vague, yeah. Um, well, if it's, if it's minimal, but in a order, then it's easy. If, if the images are, are minimal, but in a you know, specific order or specific... Um, order along with texture, then as, as one looks at one picture and then the next and then the next and then the next, 
you kind of create a language. Um, so as you flip the page of the CD thing, and one picture gets it gets darker and the picture gets rougher, then you're actually creating a different way to be able to communicate. If you say put together an album where the first beginning tracks are much softer, and as you get closer into the, the label design, they get darker and more and more harsh. You 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 physically put um, character to, to the label. I mean, to the you know, to the actual record, um, and, and and these things, you know, um, maybe subconsciously they 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 communicate to the people listening. So um, so these things, you know, you you know, you can use as vehicles to be able to communicate without using language, actually. But how do you keep these things um, minimal? These minimal things so functioning that they don't get too abstract, so that people still can relate to it. Um, sometimes, if, 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 if an abstraction is your purpose, to confuse, in some cases, um, um, yeah, in, in, in some cases, abstraction was actually the application. I wanted you to be confused, uh, or I wanted you to uh, wonder what the hell is he doing. Um, I, I, remember, I remember when, when I came up with Psycho 30, I, I didn't tell any anyone that there were loops on the second side, that I, that I wanted that to be discovered. And I remember being in Hard Wax and a kid would come in and, and, he, and, and, he, and he listened to the first side, which had three tracks, and then he put it on the other side, and then the needle would slide all the way to the label and then he'd take it off, and then he, they, they put the record away. And I thought that was great, because you know, if, he, if he didn't really take the time to really you know, look at the record, then you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's not really for, for him. But then over time, uh, people discovered it, and, and I thought that was maybe a little bit more special than uh, you know, put the needle on the record and yeah, okay, yeah, I'll take it, you know. So um, uh, yeah, um, some something in, in some cases uh, confusion or um, in in terms of like DJing, sometimes to just stop the music because the people are not going to go anywhere, and if they get mad, they, you know, I mean they're. They're, they, you know, they're at a party. I mean, they, you know, I mean, they're not going to kill you. Just stop the music <coughs> for a couple of seconds or maybe a half a minute, just to let the people down or to get them ready. I mean, maybe, you know, if you stop the music, they know that something else is going to happen. You know, if there's silence after all that, you know, they know that you know you're about to come with something, so the people get excited. Yeah. Um, so to do things like that, you know, or or to purposely break the music down to almost a whisper, kind of gets the people excited. When, when we, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Rob and I were discussing uh, the whole minimal thing before he released the, the album, um, we 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 uh, discussed the you know the idea of, of in, in terms of time, how long it takes for the people to really get. You know, get excited to listening to the same sequence over and over again. It, it was about it was about two and a half to three minutes. If you put the needle at the beginning of the record and you and you just simply let it play, and you stand back, some, somewhere within that time frame, someone's someone's going to scream because the music it just doesn't change, and because you know that it doesn't change, uh, you become more relaxed, and if become more relaxed, then you know you know the rhythm and you can move your body much better to it if you know what to anticipate. Um, so it, it brings us brings us you know excitement. Uh, it's 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 almost like the reverse of what it used to be. Uh, to make someone excited you would have to build the record up with snares and they had to go to a certain point and drop off. Um, but we discovered by just letting it do nothing uh, and, and you know, let the people React to it is actually an application as well. At that point, um, you have to in, uh, invest a lot more of work to the actual part you put in on your record. Because some people say, "Oh, this is just another one of these minimal records. I could do that just in a couple of seconds. Throw the machines on, and that's it." Yeah, that that's that's the hard part. It has to be um, a certain a certain sequence, a certain rhythm that enhances over time, or enhances the more you hear it. Uh, the better it gets. Uh, there, I, I've heard some some records where the, the more you hear the you know the least you you, you care to hear it you know anymore or it's too monotonous. Um, 
so um, and and the the records it's it's I mean from 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 what I see the we're just getting started with a minimal uh, sound. There are many other things that can be done with it. Um, so it's, it's at the very beginning. A lot of people are be, I'm starting to hear are quite discouraged um, that the records are sounding old, they, they're sounding the same, and, you know, um, uh, all of them are trying to sound like the same record. But it's this frustration that's what's going to create something different. Without it, uh, if we were all satisfied by the same record, then nothing would happen. So it's this, it's this disgust with, with the fact that it all sounds the same, that someone's going to say, okay, look, I'm tired of the same shit, I'm going to do something different. And there is where the new things come, come from. So it's actually necessary for us to get disgusted with something to be able to move on to the next. Uh, I think we leave the whole parallels to other aspects of minimal art, like architecture, product, uh, photography, and stuff like that, aside a little, because I think we won't really get a little too probably from what we're dealing with. Yeah. But um, you once said, um, if you don't try to paint a picture with your music, or with your records, you're just using the vehicle of music or uh, opportunities it gives you just to a minimum. Hmm. Could you explain that a little more? Uh, well, it's, it's impossible to be able to create music without thinking about it. Um, you know, to, to, to say that I, yeah, I just turned it on and I played something, and it just came out like that, and I didn't, I didn't have an idea. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know, you have to, you have to think, think about it. And somewhere, even, even if you're not conscious of it, you had an idea, because in the midst of, of, of actually, you know, the machine's actually running. You at, at some point you said, okay, that's it. So you thought about it. So, 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 so you're always conscious of it. So it's that, that, that phrase doesn't make sense. Um, you always think about what you're doing, you know. Um, yeah, otherwise, you wouldn't turn on your, your equipment. You just leave, you just leave it there, you know. Or, or you wouldn't reach for a specific machine. Why this one and not that one? Right? Because it has a, a certain sound that, that you want, that you're looking for. So, um, um, some people get more in depth, like myself, in creating the whole concept. Some people just turn them on and. They're looking for something, and, and they find it, and, and, and that's it. It's just the degree of what you're looking for. Um, um, and um, I'm sorry, I forgot to address the question. But I thought that was really important to, you know, to, to say. Um, could you explain that saying on, on waveforms through solution stick as barriers fall and repeat? Uh, what the, what the, well, Usually with, with me, it's the, it's the ratio. It's the how many women to men. So then I know uh, how, to start the, how to start the set off. Uh, if they're older people, I know that uh, I have to maybe take my time a little bit more because they aren't used to the music starting right away. So I can have some type of idea of the first couple of records that I need to grab first. Um, or how long. I should let it play before breaking it down to give the, the old people the rest or something like that. Uh, if the club is hot, I know that I'm going to have to at least create pockets in my set where I can let the people breathe, uh, to, to, to not make them dance as, as, as hard, um, to give them a chance to be able to go to the bar to get something to drink and then come back. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's many, many different factors. Uh, you know, how many guys you see with their shirt off. <laughs> you know, that, you know, you know, at, at, at a certain point, you know, you know you're going to have to, you know, kick it up, you know. Uh, so, so all these things um, help design how you play the records for the set, actually. And what you're going to end with, what you're going to start with, uh, what, what records you put closer to the front of, of your box because you know you need to grab those quickly um, and, and things like that. So. What, did, did, that, did that answer the question? Yes. Um, <laughs> what's the, more like the message or the, 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 the feeling you want to get across? Uh, um, no, that varies. Um, if it's a, if it's if it's a, if it's a uh, 
uh, a situation where people have been telling me how good the scene is. Like, for instance, I, I, I went to Brazil Thursday. And, um, um, and, and, and you know, prior to getting there, they were telling me, uh, you know, the scene here is great. You know, they, they listen to Detroit, and man, you know, the, uh, you know it's, 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 it's really, really good. Well, you know, I want to see how really progressive and how diverse they really are. So that night was spent seeing how far we can go in different areas. So at certain points, we got really, really minimal. Uh, at, some, at some points, we got really, 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 really aggressive. At some points, I, I got house music. And it turned out, yeah, it was, it was, it was really good. It was Sao Paulo. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it varies. If, if I know that I'm going to Scotland, I know that it doesn't matter what I play, the people are going to go crazy anyway. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter because the people, you know, they work all day and they, and they want to party. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so, it, so it varies per country, per city, and things like that. Uh, if, if it's someplace that I've never been before, usually I'll put a little bit of everything in the, in the record box, just, just in case. And, and maybe I'll take a, a, a little bit more records, but I'll take more. Just, just, just to make me feel a little bit better. Yeah. Doesn't it uh, make you crazy to change the countries and continents so quickly? I mean, is there space that you can or could decide? I, I want to stay a week, or I want to stay two weeks, or. Um. Yeah, well, I know that it's it's unlikely because because I mean every every day or every other day it's it's, it's a different city. So I can't, I can't. But what I do is I say, okay, this is this is where we're going to come back to, actually. And, and we we normally we normally go back to that city and and um, yeah, I mean that's or I take a vacation or something like that, you know. Or it's, if I have days off, then I I'll, I'll go to that place or something like that. Or, yeah, but it's 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 not frequent when I can take two weeks off or something like that. Is it a question of? Money or I mean no 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 at, at a certain point it's got nothing to do with money it's time time is so scarce your time is money I mean um, no no it's, it, 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 I have to be honest it, 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 at, at, at this point it's not about it I don't care about the money I would I would just I would just you know I can think of many times where I just it would be great to just go home and watch TV I mean forget the money you know I mean I mean, I mean, I mean, at, at certain points. It, yeah, but why is it not possible? Like that is my question. Or because, because, because in a lot of cases, people ask. Very nice people ask for you to come and play because the people really want yeah. you to, you know, to come. You know, and it's hard to say no. It's really, it's really, it's really hard, hard to say no, especially if you run a late boy, and, and the people they they want you to come because they, they like they they like the musical on your on your on, on your label. So it's it's it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to, to say to say. Carl, Carl Cox will, will tell you it's it's hard it's hard to say no. You get some sweet sweet little girl on the phone and she's like you know <coughs> gonna play and yeah and you know we'll, we'll pay you anything you want and you know, how can you say no? <laughs> so so you go from here to here to here to here. But in the end, you know it's it's quite you know, rewarding when you eventually go home. And, and you think about all, all, the, all the things that you've done and all that you've seen. And one day, when, it, when it's all over, when I decide to quit, you know, I think about all the things that I've, that I've done. You know, I, I have a lot of good memories. You know. the, the, this is what I'm banking on anyway, if I can, if I can remember all these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I could say, okay, I'm not, I'm not. You know, Laurent has tried it for many times. I'm not spending for six months. You know, I'm staying home. I'm making music or something like that. But he, it, it never works. He's always at the Rex or something like that. And then after that, he's off to another country. And I've tried to quit seven times. Seven, seven times ever mm -hmm. since I started. Do you actually have the feeling you have you have been there if you just came and played one night and then leave again? Um, for me, I, I, I have a tendency to forget that I've been there. Until I, until I actually get there and I go, wow, yeah, 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 I've been here before. But the parties are never the same. Um, you know, they're never the same. It's, all, it's always different. The parties are always different. Always. Every night is always different. So it's never. Can I ask another question? No.
Um, yeah, I, I tried. I tried to make uh, uh, hip hop. And how did you change from hip hop to techno? Um, well, I, I had always played techno. Part of part of my job on the radio was to find any and everything that was new. And they they, they actually gave me money to be able to go anywhere and find anything. It was amazing. Huh? So, man. Um, I mean, it was it was it was bad. I mean, these were like major major radio stations. They were like big stations, and they were battling, so they didn't have anything to lose. So they gave me a budget, a separate studio with production. It, it was crazy, and um, um, because I had to go out and find everything that was new, techno was one of the things. So I would play that along with hip hop, and 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 you know, and it, it was just my job to to. To, to find anything, anything, you know. So I discovered, uh, you know, MC, 900 Foot Jesus, and and uh, all those groups from Texas, and uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of different uh, alternative music that I found during that time. And uh, I played it on the on the radio. I, I didn't care. You know, there wasn't a particular type of of uh, sound. I just played everything, mixed then together. Then you decided that. You wanted to take note. Um, as I got older, and it was it was it was it was hip. You know, techno was was really hip. It was it was. Well, uh, I started partying at a very early age, like ten or eleven, like every week. In the, in in the, in Detroit, you you could actually do that. There were like three or four parties that you could go to. Of course, you would have to have your parents drive you around. Um, but but there were parties that, that, that you could go to at an early age, so I learned how I learned party culture at a, at a very early early age. How to go to a party, how to talk to a girl, you know, uh, you know how to how to date. What is good music? What what you know what is really good at a really early age? So um, maybe I I, I kind of noticed that you know, you know techno was really it's really progressive. You know, it was it was much different. That you had to have a certain type of mind to be into it. So I I, I thought that that was for me. You know, so I kind of faded out of the hip hop. And actually, I, I really liked hip hop because because I I like the tricks of the DJ. I didn't particularly care for the rap and what they were saying, like Curtis Blow and things like that. I, I didn't I didn't really. It was it was the DJ culture that I really liked, and and, and the hip hop culture. Uh, you know, break break dance and things like that. And, uh, you know, uh, deep voice stands and all that. Um, you know, the rap I didn't, I didn't particularly, I didn't particularly care for. So I, I, um, I kind of faded, faded out of the hip hop thing and, and got more into techno. And there were more techno records coming, and I knew all the people that were making them. I met Juan through another friend, and uh, um, you know, I, I began to know them there. And yeah. And you stick to the techno thing, or? Uh, yeah, in, in my early in my early twenties, I decided this is this is it. This is the type of music that I want to play. Uh, I don't, I you know, well, I played house music too, because it, that was that was just the, the the most music that you would hear in, in Detroit and Chicago and, and, and you know, New York. Um, so it was kind of like between techno and, and, and house music. And then in my late twenties, I just decided you know techno is it. I really don't. I don't. I don't care if, if the music changed. This is this is the music that I want to make. This is the music that I want to to stay with, to marry, forever. And uh, a few, you know, maybe four years ago, the trend changed. I'm sure you remember when house music became much more popular. So a lot of people in Detroit changed changed to started making house music. I stayed the same. And. Um, I think maybe that's how maybe maybe uh, maybe got a little bit further in being known as, as techno and, and others because they, because they changed. Carl started making much more house music type things. Uh, the transmat sound kind of faded away and uh, and things like that. So um, I I knew that I should I should just stay focused no matter what you know what what, what happens. So just 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 to to weather it out.
will <coughs> throw your damage in your ears, you have problems um, when you make tracks? No. Huh? Um, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> um, the high end, uh, well, in my studio, I, I have uh, Alesis, the pro ones, uh, which aren't excessive on high end anyway. Uh, so they, you know, they're very flat, flat, flat monitors, and they only give you they, they give you well, they, they, they only give you a little a little bit of high end. So I offset that by some cube, very cube cube speakers. So um, I can't really tell um, the way that my monitor system at home is set up. Um, where I can kind of detect it is when I send the DAT or the C CD off to, to be mastered. <clears throat> and I compare the, the sample that, that he made <clears throat> compared to the, the actual master. <clears throat> then, then I can tell the difference between how, how many, you know, how much high, high end that, that I thought that I heard that, that I did. And it's, 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 it's some, yeah, I lost some, some high end, especially in this here. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not, it's not, I don't think it's as much. Uh, it's something, yeah, yeah. It's definitely something. It's not a big problem. Uh, no, no. I can, I can still hear. Um, I can, I can, I can still hear. Where, where, where? If you hear me DJ and like the mix goes off, it's not because I can't hear. Well, maybe because maybe the monitors. Uh, at, at times, uh, if the monitor system is not very good, when you get into really bassy records, the the low end becomes. Mushy, and you can't distinguish between what the bass is, this record is, and that one. Is. So they have a tendency to fall off. So you have to listen to the highs to be able to keep, 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 keep the, keep the <coughs> beat. And uh, you know, but if if you should if if you should, you should ever hear that happen to me, it's because I lost concentration. That's that's that's, that's usually where you know the record goes off beat is because I'm thinking of something else and I'm not. But my mind is on the third turntable, and it, and it goes off. And, Normally. Yeah, just like I'm wondering if like you want the this so called mega star sort of take the business. Uh, yeah, that's that's the another question. Whatever. Uh, you you want the guys who can tell like um, if it's like a kind of a really goal to achieve for kids. If it's like I see you spinning and say to yourself, okay, I want to be a DJ, I want to, want to get my money for DJing and producing records, and, which is like, especially nowadays, like a hard job to establish yourself in the scene or whatever. What do you, what do you say to those kids? So, uh, well, so like, like, imagine you would be like a big basketball star and you would s s s sit in front of some, like, yeah. not grown up basketball players yeah. of being I, a pro. I, I think it. I think it varies from person to person. So I can. I can only answer for, for myself. Um, but is that a, like a serious goal to achieve, or would you say finish your? No. I, well, when I, you know, when I was younger, I had this goal. It was a silly goal, but I had it anyway. It was to be the best DJ in in, in, in America. You know, I was 17 years, years old. You know, so I. I had this determination to, to be able to learn all the tricks um, that I could. I did. I learned everything. How to spin behind my back, how to, you know, the feet, the toes, everything, you know, how to, how to break the record down to, into syllables. And, um, and um, uh, also, too, there's maybe one thing that you should know, you should, you should know. I was, I was some, some things I was taught. Um, from some of the, uh, the friends of my older brother, they actually took me, snuck me into the back door, and took me into the booth, and they and they and they literally said, "Okay, there's there's the crowd, here's the box of records. Watch me, and and this is what you're going to have to do." So so they taught me how to be able to read the crowd, how to be able to anticipate when the crowd when. It, when when you can see the crowd is getting tired and things like that, and how to how, how to break it down. So so I always kept that with me, uh, you, you know, even even till today. I, I constantly watch the crowd. Um, so um, 
you know, other than the fact that I had a silly, silly idea when I was younger, um, I never really took it seriously. I, I never considered myself like a professional DJ until like, like my late twenties. Even you know, you know, one of those guys like Mr. Sven Fitch who said, "I, I like um, close the back door, no way back." I just no, no. Your point right now is no. I, I don't have a clue why I'm doing why, why I'm doing. So you're no. just going to get on the road and spinning again, but you don't know why. Exactly. I, I don't know why. No, I, I just, I, I just, I just have to assume that when I'm, I'm 80 years old. I'll know the answer, you know. But um, but compare to compare to like um, like professional sports play tennis, yeah. whatever. It's like almost the same. Like, um, like from that, what you're saying. Um. Uh, well, it's not that rock and roll image that you say. I want to be a superstar. No, I want to be no, a no, 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 no. I want to. I want to be an architect. Uh. So I. I. Um. It's just. It's just. It's just that. Uh. You know. Because I had this, this, you know, this inner, inner drive. I think to be able, you know, I, I always had this idea. Okay, this is the way that we should all listen to music. This is the way that music should be perceived. And it's kind of strange because I, I don't have, you know, specific way. It should just be perceived, just in in general, as music. Um, that it's it's this it's this it's, it's this ideology <coughs> that I have. That, that keeps this drive going over and over again. And and when we, I think that we, well, I mean, I, 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 I'll probably never ever reach this point. You know, I'll probably ever, never think that, okay, we're finally here. So it's, it's that that, that, keeps, that keeps it going. Why, I don't know. What, what pushes it? Why? I do so many parties. I don't know. I know it's for something, but what, I don't know. Because the music is still is still new, and um, uh, you know new markets are still opening, and new DJs are still coming, and new labels are still coming, and new companies are coming, and, and new situations are opening up. Um, that uh, it just keeps keeps expanding, so you know the the road becomes even longer. But I I, I, I know that I should stay on the, on the road and stay focused. And not stray away from what my what what my goal is. What is I don't know, but I, I know that it's there. This this is the direction where I should go. Mm -hmm. um, where you see the future as a DJ in the next years? Maybe you come in a, a, a big town in a, in a in a club with high technology, and you have no record, just just this. There are sampling computers in there. Um, is this a way? Maybe? I think I think. That maybe there might be, because um, I can imagine that uh, there might be a lot of people that like the way it feels to be able to be in the middle of a dance floor surrounded by 200 people, but they don't want to be bothered uh, to actually take the time to get into the car, get dressed, go to the party, and then actually deal, deal with that. But they would love to. To, to feel this way. Uh, so maybe just very far into the future, I can imagine uh, simulations of that, very, really vivid simulations of that, to be able to actually stand in the middle of a tribal gathering type situation, but you, you never left your living room. Or uh, maybe the idea of being able to emulate the sound of a particular person might be enhanced. For instance, there might be a computer program called Jeff Mills. And in the program, there are characteristics of the things that I normally do in mixing the record. And the, 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 the person actually has the option to be able to put this character on this particular track, to have it do these things. Or uh, the way that I mix, uh, you can actually take this program and put this on these group of records and sit back and, and watch this, this program mix these records the way that I would normally do it or Sven would normally do it. So the things remain the same, but they, they become more enhanced. Uh, uh, the, the options become more, I think. Um, those, those, those type of things. Like, like uh, for instance, like stu studio equipment that you don't touch but you think about. And it, it, and it and it works. Um, or uh, um, 
you know, many, 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 many different. Uh, the whole uh, the situation of I ISDN becoming airborne. There are no wires attached that uh, through some type of program you're actually I'm actually able to make a track with someone you know just here uh, or you know we can actually hear someone spin like, actually in Cleveland or something like that or, you know I, I can imagine those type of things come coming into play um, of course you know DJ in a party and not even being there hol holographs and those those type of things we're, you know we're trying really hard now you know we're, we're doing like simulcast someone is, wants some person's in in, in another country and, and and there's a big screen or something like that and you actually hear the sound in real time and things like that. We're, we're trying really hard to, to make those things happen and, and, to, and, and, to, and to make those things you know more more, more, more frequent. Um, but as technology as computers become more then we, we, we can apply them. Um, you're now 35 a bit right? Uh, basically, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, which will you do after stop, um, spinning? Fairly? Stop spinning. I, well, I, I had this big plan to uh, to eventually finish all four all four of the labels that consist of axes uh, con that, that consist of axes. Stop, stop spinning, to be able to stay home with my wife and my children, and to continue to make music whenever I want, or to go out to play or DJ whenever I want, um, and uh, to administrate and uh, watch all the music that I've made over all the years, you know, or maybe do really special things like that. Still, still stay in the music industry, mm -hmm. and uh, just, just live a, for me, just a, a comfortable life, you know, um, to be maybe more instrumental in advancing the music in terms of uh, like an art form, things like that, uh, after spending so, so, you know, so many years and, and time to, you know, dedicated to it, it would be crazy to kind of ignore it and, and walk away and say, okay, I'm finished, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to, to, to someone else, you know, so uh, to, to kind of watch all the things that, that I've done. In addition to new, new things, and 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 I can see that that it actually may be possible to do that. Um, like I said, the music is still quite new. The the whole structure of it is is quite new. So maybe 35, 36, 37 might be maybe the oldest age. So it's my generation. Uh, you know, that will probably lay the groundwork for many other DJs and record producers to come. So it's really important that we do things, for instance, like like, like the exhibition that, that I'm doing now. It's just another way to be able to advertise a different, from a different perspective, the same thing. It's, it's a purpose-make uh, thing, but it's just from a different perspective using a different format. So my ideal is that other people can actually use the same idea to promote a different idea. So it's just an example that it could be done. So that's, that's you know, and, and me and, and, and other people, we, we, we have the same idea. We, we need to be able to do as many things as possible just so that we can say that it's been done and, and other people can use them as well. Do you think um, politics should stay out of music? Um, in some cases, in some cases, no. I think I think uh, because the, the message of music can, can be so strong that uh, if the message is, is positive, uh, or say, for instance, the message is to promote uh, more open thinking. Yeah, I think I think that the music is actually a like a perfect vehicle um, to 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 for instance to 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 try to explain the idea that it's not a question of this or that, but it's everything in between, uh, or known as the gray area. Um, music is a perfect example. Uh, basic channel is a perfect example. It's not house. It's not techno. It's something in, in between. It's good, uh, 
so then you begin to ask the question, does it really matter what it's really categorized as? In the end, it's no. It's just good. So, so um, those, those type of things we're beginning to learn, like where you're from, how old you are, um, what it's called. In the end, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I'm originally from Detroit. I lived in New York uh, and Berlin. And now I live in Chicago and, and in London. So what type of music do I make? Dismissed for heute. Ah. <laughs>